my friends, we are in a series entitled Discipleship. We've been in it a while because I've been really feeling from the Lord to take my time on a topic such as this because the Lord says that we are to go into all the earth and make disciples. And so we really got to have a handle on, well, what am I making and am I one? You know, to make a disciple, you have to know what a disciple is and you have to examine if you're a disciple. And so just to touch on a few things over the last several weeks, we've touched on everything from like last week, for example, a disciple has discernment. And so how do we discern the direction of the Lord? How do we know if it's God or if it's just the pizza that we ate? <laughs> and it's messing with our head, right? Uh, you know, so we talked about discernment. We talked about uh, a couple weeks back, the pressures of life. As disciples, how do we handle pressure differently than the world handles pressure? Our whole perspective on pressure is different. We talked about prayer. We had a whole service just geared towards prayer, if you remember, a few weeks back. I, I spoke for 10 minutes, and we got into prayer for each other. You know what's funny about that? I thought, you know, I wonder, especially at second service, which is, you know, tends to be sometimes lighter than first service. I thought, I wonder if anyone's going to come out, and we, we might be done with prayer and have a lot of time left over. Who knows? You know, that, that, that group is just a little less ready to charge in and do stuff. And we were praying with people for over an hour after the service got out. There were so many people uh, wanting prayer and, and, and coming out for that. So we talked about disciples pray for each other. We talked about uh, personal church versus corporate church, that disciples make church a part of their life. But not just this corporate church, but that daily we are having church with people, meaning you're not having to go to a service every day, but, but literally when you catch the vision that every one of us is kind of a pastor in our own right, taking on two or three people throughout the week that we are shepherding, that we're ministering to. And so we're all called to that type of ministry. And then I decided to put you all on the pastoral payroll. So you should be seeing those checks anytime. Uh, if you don't get them, see Travis Swash, he has them. Okay. Uh, that's what he gets from wearing that shirt. Anyway, um, also... And we talked about um, how does the disciple respond to failure, responding to failure. Uh, as disciples, our response to failure is different than others. And on and on it goes. We've, we've talked a lot. We talked about sharing your faith at work as a disciple. How do I do that? And I'm going to request from my light guy that that light right there be turned down just a little bit. Because every time I look up and look down, I see nothing but dots. And then I'm going to be tempted just to say dots, and it won't make any sense to you. Because I can't read anything. Anyway, today, however... What we're going to go after, uh, and I told you in this series, we're going back and forth from being a disciple and also how to make disciples. Today, we're going to talk about a good old-fashioned winning souls to the Lord kind of a message. Evangelism, winning souls to the Lord. Now, as I say that, some people get all different types of thoughts in their minds. Some people, are they love the idea of winning souls. Other people, it's downright intimidating to them. Talk to somebody about the Lord, but that's so personal, and that just seems so like, uh, you know, like I'm cutting into their life, and so we're going to talk about that today, but here's the good news. Uh, we're going to let Paul the Apostle show us how to do it. I'm not calling myself Paul the Apostle. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I've titled my message today, Winning Souls, the Paul the Apostle Way, because I believe he gives us a little diagram here, a little blueprint, if you will, on how to do this. And I believe if we follow this, you will be amazed how this will fall right into your hands. It's not going to be this awkward, weird, oh no, I got to do this kind of a thing. I think you'll find it quite like, wow, this is, this is spelled out for me, you know? And I want to follow Paul's example. How many would say Paul the Apostle was pretty effective at winning souls, right? So why not look at his pattern? So we're going to get into that today. My hope, ladies and gentlemen, is by the time you leave here, you have a new excitement about winning souls to the Lord, some new confidence in the area of winning souls to the Lord, and also maybe that it becomes a bigger part of your thoughts throughout the day. Like, oh yeah, maybe I should be about this. And so, without the condemnation, this is, this is just something, man, we're in it together. Everything we talk about, we're in it together. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for everybody that's here today. Thank you for such a beautiful group of people. Uh, Lord, I just pray that they got out of bed this morning. They, they thought, saw a purpose, even though thank you for the extra hour of sleep, by the way, Lord. But anyway, um, that they're here because, not because they had nothing else to do. I believe people are here because they're hungry for you, because they want to be more like you, because they want something today that they can take out there and, and use in real life. And so, Lord, that's only going to happen if, if you speak through me and help me to just be simply a vessel because these are your people and this is your church. And so we just keep that in perspective, Lord. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So here's the portion I'm going to base all this on today. We're going to, we're going to read the blueprint, and then I want to go back and unpack it with you, okay? And what I'm about to read, I know I feel like a broken record, but, but hear me. What I'm about to read to you, I've quoted this verse to you many times. And I felt like the Lord said to me this week, I want you to go back and dissect that thing that you quote so easily all the time. As I've never actually went back and looked at it with, with like deep, you know, studying. And when I did, it's like this whole little message came in front of me. It's like, wow, this is more than just a little thing I'm going to quote in 20 seconds like I normally do. So, of course, there's a lot of buildup, as usual, when I set the stage. Let's see if I, the payoff is there. I hope so. Okay, I am in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I am starting in verse 19. And this is Paul the Apostle letting us in and how he wins souls to the Lord. Here we go. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Now let me tell you, the extent that I've ever spent on this verse, is, as I've always just quoted this one little part of it. See, Paul said he became all things to all people to win some. And that's as far as I've ever gone. It's like, yay, so just try to bless everybody and win them. And, but it's like the Lord said, no, no, go back. I got a whole blueprint in there. And, and so I have done that this week. And like this, I try to preach things to you that speak to me because if it doesn't speak to me, I can't even make it through. There's been times in my past, and I've learned this, that I've preached things in the past where I said, well, I'm not really feeling like this, this is something I'm getting a lot of, but hopefully somebody else does. And there's been times I've been halfway through a sermon that I just wanted to say, who wants to just go get a pizza or something, you know? It's like, huh? I'm in it now, I got to finish it. So I don't do that anymore. I try to make sure I'm preaching something that is hitting me. Okay, and I learned a lot this week from this, and I'm using this in my life. So I hope you do too. So before we dissect that, I got to whet your appetite just a little bit more because I want to make sure before we get into the meat of this that you realize how important winning souls to the kingdom really is. Guess what? I got a news flash for you. It's not just something for other people. Do you ever think that other people will win people to the Lord? As for me, too busy. Too busy. Other people. Well, I want you to just, before we get into this, is it important to be a soul winner? Is it important to literally be used by God to bring somebody out of darkness and into the kingdom of his marvelous light? Well, let's, let's take a look at a few verses. I, I could spend hours on this. I'm going to just hit a couple verses, okay? Uh, some I'm going to look up, some we're just going to skim. But really quick, to set the table, Psalm 105, for example, says that we are to make known the nations what God, what, wait, I'm reading that wrong. Make known among, there it is, among the nations what he has done. Simple truth. Make known. Make it known what he has done. I just cut a piece of that for time's sake. In Matthew, let's turn to this one. Uh, I want you to really hear this one in Matthew. There's a job opening. I want you to maybe put your resume in. See if you can catch the job opening. Uh, so, so get ready to submit your resumes when you hear this. Okay, here it goes. It says here, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Then he said to his disciples... I'm in Matthew, did I tell you the verse? Sorry, Matthew 9, verse 37, getting ahead of myself. It says, then he said to his disciples, there's no need to share your faith, plenty of others are doing it. It says here, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is what God is saying. Hey, there is so much harvest out. There's so many people that are just ready, like I was at 18 years old. I was just ready on the edge of my seat for somebody to come up and tell me, hey, Paul, good news. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's got a plan for your life. I was just needing that. But God was saying, but there's a lack of laborers. You see, my friends, some of you have heard me say this before. 
Paul Rowling at 18 years old had long hair and a tough look on his face because I wanted to have this image, but little did anybody know, including myself, that just on the other side of that hard exterior was a heart that was ready to receive Christ. And all it took was somebody to come up to me and share Christ with me. I didn't know it, they didn't know it, but God knew it. And so the Lord says in this section of scripture, Oh, the harvest is plentiful. There are so many people just like I was, just waiting, just waiting for somebody to come up to me and tell me the good news. But he says, here's the problem. There's not enough laborers. That's why he's taking resumes. You see, there's not enough laborers. Well, what's the qualification for the job? You have to be willing. (laughs) There it is. You have to be willing because God will use you no matter how much you feel like you lack your theology expertise. God will still use you. It's amazing how he'll bring it to light. You know, even when you feel like you don't know if you're saying it right, God will speak through you. He's looking for willing vessels, my friends, willing vessels. Uh, Move on really quick here. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 8, the Lord says, whoever acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, the Holy Spirit will come to you and you will become witnesses you will become witnesses in all of the world. What does a witness do? Who can tell me what a witness does? There it is. Whoever has said that? Who said that? Ken? $50, Travis. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm still in fundraising mode. Kyle, I'll bid Travis for giving him 50 bucks. Sorry. We'll move on. Anyway, uh, you're right. A witness testifies. See, part of the reason the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit is not just to help us in our daily life, which is awesome, and he's come to give us all kinds of power and, and, and to, to, the, to, to be, uh, fulfill his call in our ministry and our life, but he also has given us the Holy Spirit to be witnesses, to testify, so that people say, man, I see something different in you, and then, you know, we're to be witnesses for what God has done. That's Acts 1.8. In 1 Corinthians 3, let me, let me go there. I'm all just setting the table for this, for this going back to Paul, the apostle thing in a second. But I want you to know how f- important it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. This kind of shows you what I'm about to read, how much we're a team, how we're in this together. Paul, the apostle talking, says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Listen to this part, folks. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. Did you hear that? We are God's fellow workers. That means we all work together with God to bring people into the kingdom. What if you start seeing yourself like that? What do you do for a living? Well, I'm an engineer, but really I am a, uh, well, I'm on, I'm, a, I'm on God's payroll. I'm a co-worker with him to bring people into the kingdom. See, that's, that's what he says. And I get it, my friends. As I look around this room, we all have one thing in common. Man, are we busy. <laughs> Some of you work a ton of hours. Some of you have a ton of kids. Some of you are just, you know, just, you're, you're all busy. We're just busy. I don't know why we're all so busy, but we're busy. And so sharing our faith often can be this little afterthought. Boy, I sure hope I get to that one day. Hope everyone else is doing it because I just don't have time. You know? and, but yet, the word shows us that we're all on the team. Maybe you're a planter. Maybe you're a waterer. At the end of the day, it's God who brings the increase. And if you're the kind of person who's sitting there thinking, you don't understand, I just don't have what it takes to be the kind of person who wins souls, well, you've come to the right place. Because I'm going to show you that you're right where you need to be. Whatever, but however far along you are in the Lord, if you've been saved since 8 a.m., you're, you're ready to go. <laughs> you're ready to be used. So, all right, that's a lot of buildup. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 as we begin to dissect this. So point number one, point number one in Paul the Apostle, winning souls, Paul the Apostle way. Look at the first verse. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant of to all. Everybody say, servant to all. all. That caught my eye, and I start saying, okay, so what is Paul saying? He's saying, listen, before I open my mouth to tell them the good news, I'm a servant to them. And the thing that starts popping in my head is, what does a servant do? A servant adds value to somebody's life. So what if you and I, as we're targeting people that we want to win to Christ, say to ourselves, you know what? I'm going to add value to their life. I'm going to do something. I'm going to serve them. And Paul said it himself. I don't have to do this. I'm not 
I'm not paid to be their servant. I don't work for them. It's not like I'm under some obligation. I choose to do it. I choose to serve somebody. Now think about it. You're talking about a lost person now. I choose to serve this lost person, this person who doesn't know God. I'm literally going to come alongside them and serve them, bless them somehow. I'm going to add value to their very life. That's what he's saying. I'm going to add value to them. And so it's changed the way I even pray when I talk to the lost. I say, Lord, show me how to add value to their life. Show me how to be the kind of person that after they have met with me. Like here's an example. I did a funeral yesterday uh, before this, this event. And so Friday I was meeting with the family. And I don't know any of these people except for the one that goes to our church, him and his wife. But I didn't know the rest of the family. So my whole prayer was, Lord, I don't know where any of these people are with you. But by the time they're done meeting with me, I just want to add value to their life. I want them to feel served. I want them to feel cared for with nothing in return. Because see, that blows the lost away. You want to know why? Because the pattern of the world is this. I'll do something for you, but I want something in return. Nobody does something without the expectation of getting something back. Nobody does that, right? Yeah, I'll do something for you. What's in it for me? Hmm, you know? And if you listen long enough, you hear what's in it for them. But when you tell somebody, you know, I, I just want to bless you, and they see there's nothing in return that you're trying to get. People don't know what to do with that. Well, surely you want something. You know what you could say to people? Well, doesn't everybody need somebody in their life who just wants to be their friend with no strings attached? It blows people away. They don't expect it. And you know what verse goes along with that? In Matthew 5, Jesus tells us to be salt and light. And I start thinking about salt and light. I want to challenge you to do something, my friends, if you don't already do this. When you read the Bible, man, I don't know about you, I can camp out for hours on two or three verses. All right, maybe not hours, but, but I can camp out for a while. Because every word, if you, if you will go into your word prayed up and asking for discernment and asking God to give you a sermon so you can preach it to your group of two or three, you will get a sermon out of it. Every word is there for a reason. I start focusing on salt and light for a while. I can't tell you how many times I've read salt and light and just said, oh, we're to be salt and light. Okay, sounds, sounds holy. <laughs> I'm salt and I'm light. But then I start thinking about it. What does salt do? Salt not only makes things taste better, but you know what else salt does? It, it, it's a little trick that the bartenders use, why they put the peanuts out there. Not only does it make you want to get beer, you know, but it also makes you want to eat food. It makes you hungry. Salt whets your appetite. That's why when you eat a few McDonald's french fries, you know, you just got hungrier because of the salt. I could steal a line from the comedian last night about salt. <laughs> Sorry, inside joke. But anyway, we see so, and then what does light do? Light, if it's at the right, light can do a couple things. Light can brighten somebody's day, but it also can be obnoxiously bright and ruin their day, right? So I've been, been asking the Lord to, to let me be the kind of person that makes people hungry for you and brightens their day. Now think about this. Before you've ever shared Christ, you're going to add value to somebody. I want you to start praying this. Lord, help me to add value to this, this lost person that I want to win to you. Let them find themselves getting more hungry for you just from being around me. You know how you do that? You start to feed their soul. And as you start to feed their soul, they want more. Because everybody wants their soul fed. You know, your flesh, you feed your flesh easily. But, but we have the power because the Holy Spirit's in us to feed people's soul. So see, think about this for a second. If you're going to be salt, you're going to be the kind of person that after people have been around you, they're like, you know, I don't know what it is, but something about that person fed something in me. You can do that to people because, see, we're not, we're not the lost. We have something that their lost friends don't have. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, man. We got the love of Christ in us. And if we go in with no agenda other than I'm just going to love this person. See, sometimes we go in with an agenda. We want to share Christ with them, which you might say, well, that's an agenda. But see, you got to be careful with that because if you're trying to, you know, because they're going to see that as, oh, see, I knew you wanted something from me. You want to be all nice to me for five minutes so that you could build up to giving me your sales pitch about Jesus. You want to know why that happens? Because I think we're so used to the quick fix of everything. We don't want to invest in anything. Just give me the quick fix. You know what I mean? And we, just tell me how I make a million dollars without having to do anything. You know, this, that's why Amway started, right? Just, just tell me what I got to do. We don't like to invest. So, some, so often it's like, well, I'll give this guy five minutes. I'll be really nice. And then I'll lay the gospel on him and hopefully that's good enough. But see... I believe the Paul the Apostle way is I'm going to serve them. I'm going to add value to them. 
I'm going to make them hungry for God. I'm, I'm going to be different than everybody else. You can get to the gospel, and we're going to show you that. You'll get to the gospel. But first, am I serving? Am I adding value? Am I being salt and light? Am I making them hungry? Am I feeding something in their soul? Am I brightening their day? You know how many people are in a dark world all day long, and you have the ability to brighten their day? Every time you come around them, the way you talk to them, the way you look at them, the way you serve them, the way you're just invested in them, you can brighten someone's day. You'll get to the gospel. Settle down. You don't have to be in this hurry. You've got to close the deal in 10 minutes. So what do you say? You in? You want Jesus? Good. I got another one. I'll never see you again. That doesn't work. That's not the Paul the Apostle method that I appreciate. So our point number one is be a servant to them. Feed their soul. Brighten their day. Add value to somebody's life. That's all point one. Now point number two. Let's go on and see what Paul says here. Then he goes on to give this example. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Now watch this. He says in, you know, in parentheses here, in quotations, though not being myself under the law. See, Paul wasn't under the law because we don't want to be under the law. We're under grace, right? So think this through for a second. This is what I had to spend some time on and not just skim over. You notice Paul didn't say this. He didn't say, to those under the law, I said to them, look, you guys shouldn't be under the law. I need to correct you. You're, you're an error being under the law. What's wrong with you guys? No, he didn't say that. He said, I became just like them. This is what he's saying. Not really like, like them, like he's not compromising, but he found a way to make a connection. This is what the Lord put on my heart. Connection, not correction. Let that sink in for a minute. He was more concerned with connecting with them than correcting them. The correction will come later, friends. You know, the wisdom of the, of the Lord is foolishness to the world anyway. So you're wasting your breath often if you're trying to preach to a non-believer the things of the kingdom before the kingdom light has gone off. They're just going to think you're a fool, okay? So what did Paul do? He said, I connected before I corrected. But so often we want to correct people. Look at you, you're living in sin. What's wrong with you? And they're looking at you like, what are you talking about? I don't even know this, this law that you're talking about, whatever. No, connect before you correct. And if you really look at that, that's what Paul's saying. He says, I became as one under the law. I know it's not right to be under the law. I wasn't actually, he says, you know, that's why he says to the side, I wasn't really under the law, but I, I found a way to connect with these Jews. To the weak, I became like I was weak. So that means when he goes to the gym, even though he could bench 300 pounds, he puts 150 on there. No, probably not. That's probably not what that means. Look at me. I'm so weak. So I'm going to win you. I could really bench 300 now. That's not what he's talking about. But my point is, he was concerned about connection. Now, let's be honest for a second. You want to know why we don't connect very well with the world sometimes? Because, and I know we're all coming from different places, but a lot of times we forget where we've come from. I can't tell you how many times I find myself being appalled by the world. Because let's be real, the world can be nasty. The world can be, they can be rude and they can say obnoxious stuff and they can be just, ugh, like, why would I want to be around this? And we almost feel dirty, like we got to take a shower after talking to the people of the world, right? You ever been there? Just like, man, this is like, I just want to have as little contact with you as I can. But, but that's not what Paul's doing here. So how do you connect with the world when they seem so different than you and, and, and they appall you? How do you connect? Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Find the 1%, if that's what it takes, that you do agree on and give 100% to the 1%. How many are tracking with me? Find the 1%. Maybe the 1% is we both agree we don't like the Spartans, and then we give 100% effort to that. Or maybe you give, you give 1% to... It's a nice day, isn't it? Sure is. Hey, let's build on that. How long can we talk about the weather? You know, Give 100%. Now listen, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but you know what I think we do in church life? We find the 1% we disagree on, and we give 100% effort to that. But what if we gave 100% to where we can find a connection? You know what you call that? You call that building. You call that making a road, a bridge to their heart. You find a way to connect, 
and you give all your energy to that 1% because that 1% will suddenly become 2% and will suddenly become 10%. And you're working your way into their heart. Connection before correction. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to remember that. Connection before correction. People won't receive your correction without the connection. But you know why it's hard for people? Because it takes work. It means I got to invest. I got to invest in somebody. It's not quick fix. We like quick fix. You're all hoping I'm going to give you the one thing you can say to wins everybody the Lord without any getting your hands dirty and actually getting involved in people's lives. And well, my friends, it doesn't happen like that. Point number three. I believe Paul was willing to say, God bless you when somebody sneezed. And I am too, whoever that was for. Anyway, Paul was invested, my friends, invested into souls. Because you see, you don't get anywhere with people without some investment. Investment. And how many know you invest in what is valuable to you? Do you not? I got a lot of friends who hunt. They invest in hunting. They won't think twice about missing church to go hunting. They will invest big money in guns and all the, the stuff. Why? Because they value it. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying they value it. You know, I know, I know ladies who, man, they got to have a new pair of shoes for every outfit they have. And it you know, costs big money to get their hair done. All that. Why do they go through all that? Because they're invested. And I barely put any money into my hair. I've really gotten free about that. <laughs> so has Rick Sugden. Anyway, um, so, but you invest in what you care about. Did God invest in people? He sent his only son to die brutally for us. My friends, that's what you call an investment. Who are we supposed to be like? Is that the goal, to be like Christ? And who did Jesus invest in? He invested in people. Who are we to invest in? People. Problem is, I think if we're going to be really honest, most people, a lot of people, almost kind of an inconvenience. <laughs> They're kind of a, like... Tolerate. We tolerate people instead of celebrate people. What if you stop tolerating people and start celebrating people? Jesus didn't tolerate people. He didn't say, ugh, more people. Man, he loved them. The Bible says he was moved with compassion from the lost. How do you, how do you make that happen in your life? Just, you can't just snap your finger. Right? Suddenly, I love people. You pray. And you say, Lord, help me to be salt and light. Give me an appetite for the lost. Help me to see people like you see them. Mother Teresa was asked a long time ago, obviously. She was asked, where do you find, where do you find it in yourself to love this, these down and out people, the, the bottom of the barrel people in life, you know? Where do you, how do you do it? And she says, it's real easy. When I look into their eyes, I see Jesus. Ask God to give you that kind of heart. Ask God to break your heart for the lost. That we don't tolerate the loss, we celebrate the opportunity because the harvest is plentiful, right? And the laborers are few. That means there's plenty of opening. The laborers are few. Target somebody and start to say, Lord, give me, give me a heart for that person that's lost. I know they're vile. I know that they swear and I know that they cuss and I know that they watch the wrong things and I know they go out and do this and that and then everything else. But Lord, let me find the 1%. Let me serve them. Let me add value to their life. Let me invest in them. Let me begin to be salt and light into their life so that I might have an inroad to them. And Paul was invested in people. Now, I want to stop out, step outside of this section of Scripture for a moment, and I want to read to you Proverbs 11, verse 30. For time's sake, I'm just going to quote it to you. It says here, He who wins souls... This is the second half of the verse, or the first half maybe. He who wins souls is wise. Short and sweet. And I used to read that and I'd say, he who wins souls is wise. Lord, I don't see the connection between wisdom and winning souls. I think of wisdom as, wow, what ability to make these great decisions and knowing when to say this and when not to and understanding all these mysteries. What does it have to do with winning people to Christ and wisdom? But then it kind of hit me. Anybody who's going to win souls to the Lord is going to be invested in people. They're going to care about these things. They're going to care about what God cares about. And my friends, when you begin to care about the things that God cares about, and the things that move him move you, and the things that break his heart break your heart, you have become wise. You become wise when you start to be moved by the things that move God's heart. 
That's why God called David a man after his own heart. What does that simply mean? It means what breaks his heart breaks my heart. We're, we're on the same page. You know, that's where I want to be. I want to be on the same page as God. You know, that whatever moves God moves me. Not that I'm so into me. And God had a way and has a way of looking at the lost. Jesus looked at the lost, not with disgust, but with what they could be all in for Christ. My friends, I know who I was before Jesus. I was an absolute mess. Thank the Lord somebody looked at me and saw past the surface stuff. I don't know that I would have with me. I wish I could go back and talk to me. I'd tell me to get a haircut. Anyway, um, I'd say, bro, your future is what it is. Get a head start now. Cut the hair. Work your way in. This is going to be shock to you. Anyway, just thinking out loud. The other thing I want to tell you is uh, Matthew 18. Matthew 18. I love Matthew 18. I think we need to go there. It's worth taking the trip to Matthew 18. So uh, go in your car and turn left and head a few books back to Matthew 18. And you'll see my property there. It's chapter, verse 12 through 14. How did I get all the way to chapter 14? See, when I talk and turn, can't do it. All right. Matthew 18, verses 12 through 14. What do you think? This is Jesus speaking to us. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than, the, than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. You know what jumped out at me there, my friends, as I read that? We like the 99. It's cozy hanging out with the 99. But what's the heart of Jesus? It's to leave the 99 and go after the one that went astray. I think back to when I was a new Christian and, and I was attending this church in Royal Oak, Michigan, and I had my click. I had my click of friends. And I couldn't wait till service was over to hang out in my circle until the Lord starts speaking to me saying, see that one over there or that one over there? Nobody ever gives them any attention. They are barely hanging in there. They're like a lost sheep about ready to run. I want you to go minister to that one. But I was like, but Lord, I want to hang out with the 99, man. I got my buddies and we got all this stuff in common. And you know, I don't want to leave the 99 to go after the one. But I realized how rewarding that was. Because we all have ones around us. And we have our 99. And I was so blessed by something a lady in this church said to me last week. She said, you know, I noticed so-and-so hasn't been coming around lately and... I'm going to really make it my point to go after her. I mean, she meant like in a violent way. And she's in jail. That's why she's not here. But anyway, she, her heart was in the right place. But no, I mean, I loved it because she, like, that's, that's the church, man. The church isn't just this, coming to hear a message and all that. I mean, I'm grateful that you're here. But I'm saying it's more. It's, it's going after the lost ones, man. Leaving the 99 and finding that one that everybody else has ignored. That's Jesus. You might have people in your work that people can't stand. Now you know who to go after. You have people that other people just stay on the other side of the road. They, they don't look like you. They don't smell like you. They don't talk like you. They, you'd rather just be away from them. And the Lord might be saying, but that's my heart. I go after those. Ask the Lord who's the one that I'm supposed to go after. You can still hang out with the 99, but make time for the one. The last point in this, and then I'm going to give you just a couple little things before I send you on your way, little things that you can say to the lost people you've been investing in. Before I give you that, though, I want to read one more thing in 1 Corinthians 9, and look at the last thing Paul says here. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Everybody say, all means. All means. I hear passion there, do you? When's the last time you said to the Lord? Lord, by all means, I've got to win them to Christ. Lord, whatever it takes, let me win them. When's the last time you prayed that? When's the last time I've prayed that? I've prayed, Lord, let me, you know, let me speak into their life or this, but when's the last time you got that passionate before the Lord about a lost person in your circle, in your life, and said, Lord, what, by all means, I put it into my vernacular, whatever it takes, Lord, I've got to win this one to you. Whatever it takes, I will do anything. Lord, use me to win that one. You don't think the Lord's moved by that prayer? 
And here's the good news. I got some great news for you. This is going to set you free in a way. Everybody on the planet of this earth wants to get saved. They just don't know it yet. They just don't know it yet. Everybody is seeking that peace and that joy and that, ah, I'm home, that comes from serving Jesus. Everybody wants to be saved. They just don't know that's what they want yet. But see, as you get close to people and you invest in people and you add value to people and you pray for people and you brighten the day of people and you make people hungry by the way you're, you're feeding their soul, guess what happens? Suddenly a relationship is developed and now you've earned the right to say some things to them. Because now they're asking you, you know, tell me more. You know, they, they want, they're going to receive from you because you've done all these other steps. Now you can start to plant some real seeds in their life. I want to leave you with just a couple thoughts. Oh, let me add one more thing before I give you this couple thoughts. I almost didn't finish it. I do all for the sake, because Paul goes on to say, by all means that I might save some. And then verse 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. You know what that means? That means... I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. I want to do life with them. I don't just win them to Christ, and the minute, minute I got them, I leave them, and I go minister to somebody else. No, I want to share in their blessings. I want to be in this journey with them. I don't want to just win you to Christ. Do you remember a few weeks ago? I just got to tell you this really quick. Do you remember a few weeks ago I used a guy as an example, and I said there was this guy who came into the church, and he was drinking, and then he got saved, and then he got baptized, and then his, you know, did you, does anybody remember me sharing that, just, just like that what this church is all about? Well, guess what? That guy moved back to Marlette. Remember I told you he moved out of state? He moved back to Marlette, and he's sitting in the back row back there. Say hi, Bill. <laughs> Praise God. Because I mentioned you, I want $20. Anyway, that's what we do. Thank you. I appreciate that. Don't judge me. It's how I make a living. Um, no, you don't have to. You can keep it, but I appreciate the gesture. But see, that's what we do, right? We, we take people and, 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 man, he's got a good marriage. His wife's back there with him. Hi, Heidi. I didn't mean to ignore you. There's Heidi. And they got beautiful kids, and they're serving God. And, and let me just tell you, that's what we were born for, man, to invest in people invest in people, but be with them for the long haul, not just, okay, move on. Now, I'm going to give you just, uh, in, in my couple minutes, I'm not big on saying, hey, here's the magic line, but I did pray about it. I, I did feel like people probably want to know, what are some things I can say to cross from, man, I'm investing, I'm feeding their soul, there's, there's definitely a connection here, I've earned the right, blah, blah, blah. How do I, what are some things I can say that just don't feel terribly awkward? Because sometimes it feels terribly awkward, you know what I mean? And sometimes you do have to just say some things. There's never going to be this, this, you know, little cutesy thing. It's just all packaged well. But, but as, people, it, as people confide in you, because people you invest in will confide in you. Right? It's just, you just can't get around it. They'll confide in you if you don't invest in them. But they will especially confide in you if you invest in them. A couple things you could say. Number one, you could say this. Man, I wish you had the peace that I do. These are little wet the appetite kind of statements. Man, I wish you had the peace that I do. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I want you to have the peace that I do, but, but, but I can't give it to you. You know, you can, you can say that to them. You can say, I wish I could give you the hope that I have. When somebody's confiding, you, you know, boy, I wish I could give you, I want you to have the hope that I have. You can say that. It's bold, but you've earned the right at this point to say it. You can say this, and this is bold, but you can say this. We've been friends for a long while now. Can I share my faith with you? What's the worst that could happen? You know, thanks, but I'm really I'm not interested. You know, if they say that, you say, here's what you do. You want to whet their appetite? You want to keep it fun? You say, okay, well, one day you'll be ready. What do you mean by that? Well, you'll see. One day you'll be ready. Have fun with it. Don't be offended. Well, <laughs> fine. Don't want to hear my faith. One day you'll be ready, and when you are, I'll be here. You could say, uh, have I ever told you why I love God so much? You ever wonder why I love God so much? Can I tell you? Can I tell you why I love God? I know you notice I love, because if they see that you're on fire for God, they're going to ask, man, what? church again? God, what? You're doing what? Yeah, have I ever told you why I love God so much? There's many ways, my friends. Write your own script. But I'm just going to tell you, it's, there, there comes a point when you've done these other things, that they are ready. 
And don't forget this. God wants them saved. They want to be saved. They just don't know it yet. We were all created in God's image. You know what that means? If we're all created in God's image, that means we were all created with a heart that wants God. It just doesn't know it yet. That's why at the right time, at the right moment, the light bulb goes off. The whole reason any of you are saved today is because you didn't even know you were needing it. You didn't even know you were desiring it, but God knew, and he sent the right person at the right time. I'm standing here today because somebody invested in me. Chances are you're here today. When I say here, I don't just mean in church. I mean you're in the kingdom today because somebody somewhere probably invested in you. Somebody somewhere probably said to you, hey, can I share my faith? Or hey, have you considered this? Or hey, whatever their line of choice was. But my friends, we can't be selfish and just say, well, it stops with me. It stops with me. You know, I, I'm, out of my four kids, I have one boy. That means the rolling name is going to continue. So I'm excited about that. No pressure, Joseph Rowling. But think of that in this context. Spiritually, somebody invested in you. Are you going to keep the family name going? Or is it going to stop with you? Don't let it stop with you. You want to know why Christianity is still around today? Well, obviously, because it's God's will. But from generation to generation to generation to generation, people were telling people. People are telling people. That's how God does it. People tell people. You tell your kids, but you tell other people too. And then they tell people, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and you buy shampoo. Anyway, that's a commercial from my past, having flashbacks. I think it was Prell. Anyway, why do I know these things? I don't use it. So my friends, are you with me? Are you getting this? Is this clear as mud? No, is this clear? Invest. Let's recap, and then I'll let you go. Let's recap. Add value through service. Serve them. Be salt and light in their life. Be, make them, make them a point of value in your life. Meaning, by all means, Lord. Are you willing to pray that? By all means, use me. That's passion right there. Get passionate about it. Make them a priority. Invest in them. Number three, be like Paul who said, that I may share in their blessings. Meaning, I want to be involved in them for the long haul, not just... My little agenda, get them saved and moved on. No, I'm, I'm, in, I'm invested in them. Number four, connect before correct. I know you want to correct them all. I get it. Connect first and then correct under God's timing. And my friends, if we walk this out, ask the Lord to give you the right statement. You don't have to use one of these lines I've used. They're not lines. I hate to, like, sounds like a dating line. Hey. Your feet tired or whatever those are. I mean, I don't want to minimize these to lines. These are more than lines. But I want to tell you, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be like, oh, I, so many people, they, it's like diving into the pool. I get so close, but then I just, I just can't, I end up jumping. Don't be afraid to put that out there because they were created to get saved. They're made in God's image. They've been waiting for your message, even if they don't know it. You're God's plan for the, for the lost because what does the Bible say? The harvest is plentiful. It's just the laborers that are lacking. Well, let's not let that be said of us. Just look at this room right now. There is a bunch of laborers getting ready to go out these doors. Think of what we can do. Look at this group. What if each person just in this service got excited about this? Wow. We turn this community upside down and nobody would be wearing green and white. So let's close in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I just, I'm kidding. I just pray that we would have... A passion for your people, Lord, for the lost. Because, Lord God, you created them in your image, and it's not your will that any should perish, but it's your will that all would have everlasting life. And you say, how will they know if they are not told? And, Lord, here's your your mouthpieces sitting around this room, Lord God. Your word tells us that the the laborers are few. But, Lord, let let you look at this church and say, well, there's a bunch of laborers. I know I got them. Let that be said of us, Lord. Let that be the case with us, right where we're at, even if we're not these PhD theologians yet. Let us get out there and be used by you. And I pray this for all of your wonderful people. In Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Amen. Love you guys. Have a wonderful day.